seated. God's word for our meditation this morning is found in our Old Testament lesson from 2 Kings chapter 5. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, grant me a steadfast heart and sincere repentance that I may inherit the wealth of your grace in Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, maybe you've heard people say during the course of life or trouble or in different situations, it's all a matter of getting perspective. And you know, perspective is a wonderful thing, but really, what is perspective? You know, I don't know if I can even find uh, an, accurate, uh, an accurate description or definition in the dictionary. But maybe some examples can help us understand what perspective is. You know, you can be uh, viewing a picture of something, like the Grand Canyon, but it really doesn't give it justice until you're standing there personally, right at the rim. You get a different perspective of a mountain farther away than you do up close or standing up at the peak looking down. Perspective. You know, even, let's say, if you were standing out on Highway 49 and looking at me here in the pulpit, the perspective might tell you, hey, he's a good-looking guy. And then you get here in church and get closer. Eh, maybe not so much. Perspective. I think that to the two, two of the men in our text this morning had really different perspectives, and their perspectives changed as they encountered the Lord. Last, or last weekend we heard about the man Naaman, servant to the king of Aram. You heard about how his servant girl brought him to the Lord, brought him to healing, a man who had leprosy. His life was changed. His perspective on life was changed. His perspective on God was changed. Not only because of that miracle, but because of the grace of God and his messenger. Our text for this morning takes up right after that healing. And we hear about Naaman wanting to show his thanks to God's servant and to God. He had said to Elisha, the prophet, let me give you some gifts. And Elisha would have nothing to do with it. He said, no, I will not take anything. And you can understand this a bit. At least I can. Elisha did not want to give this new convert to the faith, this new child of God, the impression that God's grace and blessings and favor, favor could be purchased. And so Elisha declined and sent Naaman off on his way. Now, Eli Naaman again was touched. He wanted to show his devotion to the Lord, so he asked for a couple of loads of dirt that, from Israel that mules, two mules could carry, and promised that he would only worship the true God. A life for a Naaman had been changed. He had been brought to faith. But you have a polar opposite that happened here. A different perspective, if you will, in Elisha's servant by the name of Gehazi. Gehazi decided to himself that he couldn't believe that Elisha wouldn't jump on this opportunity. He, you know, and, and listen again to what Gehazi the servant had said. He said, My master, let this Aramean nail him off lightly by not accepting him from him what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after and get something from him. Gehazi looks in disgust here. He looks at this servant name and this new convert as something as an enemy, in which at, he, in, in reality he was of the Arameans of the Assyrians. They were enemies of Israel. 
and thought, why shouldn't I take advantage of this situation? And then he pronounces an oath. He calls upon God's name and says, as surely as the Lord lives, I'm going to take advantage of this situation and get a gift. <coughs> you can understand in some ways, our sinful natures can anyway, and how Gehazi looked at this man as an enemy, but then calls on the Lord to do something dastardly, to take something that wasn't his. And then we're told as he went out, and we heard in our text how he went out, followed Naaman, said there's two prophet or two seminary students that have come to visit the prophet, men who are studying to be prophets. <coughs> Elisha changed his mind. Here, give me 75 pounds of silver and a couple changes of clothes for these men. A lie. And then what Naaman did was it doubled it and sent it back. And Gehazi took this. When he comes back, he hides all of these things. He even got the help of the servants to carry all of the silver back in these clothes. Once he got it back and hid, he goes right to Elisha, who knew what had happened. Whether it was through a revelation of God, a vision, or some special power that God gave Elisha, we don't know. But he knew what went on. Where'd you go, Gehazi? Nowhere. You're a liar. You stole. You took silver. You took changes of clothes. You were, had dreams of avarice and greed and wealth. And how could you do this? And he pronounced his judgment. Now, because you took what wasn't yours from Naaman, you're going to get what wasn't yours too. His leprosy. You'll be cursed with that leprosy. You'll be white as snow until the day you die. Sounds like a very serious punishment. You know, really, I remember hearing this account from the Bible in Sunday school when I was a child and thinking, wow, that's really mean. That doesn't seem to be a fun punishment to fit the crime. You know, and that's where we really need to get a perspective on God's judgment. Okay? The proper perspective on God's judgment is this. All sin deserves punishment. Punishment from God. We confess it on Sunday morning when we confess our sins. When we acknowledge that we are lost and condemned creatures. We get a proper perspective on God's judgment when we realize and get a proper perspective on our sin, okay? Because all sin damns. Not just the sin of stealing or robbery or deception, but all sin, whether it's sins of carelessness, whether it's sins of selfishness, whether it's sins that come from our mouth with foul language, whether it's sexual sin, no matter how twisted or perverted it gets or how much it doesn't, all sin requires God's wrath and judgment. All sin merits hell. We shouldn't even be here. When I was growing up, I can remember one thing that my grandmother always used to say, to say, the only reason that we're here, none of us deserves to be here. We're only here because of the grace and mercy of God. No one can say, I don't deserve God's judgment. The haze, I deserved it. Even the new believer Naaman deserved it. The prophet Elisha deserved it. You and I deserve it because of our sin as well. Let's look at God's mercy in this account as well. We see God's mercy very beautifully in what he did for Naaman. The fact not only that he healed him of his leprosy, but the fact that through the testimony of the prophet, the word, the word of God, Naaman became a follower of the Lord. So much so that he said, I will worship no other God except the Lord. 
What a wonderful blessing that is. What a wonderful reminder that is, that as Naaman had been brought to faith, it affected him. It affected him, every fiber of his being. He had been touched by the Lord. And now, it was something that affected every single thing that he did. We see God's mercy bringing an enemy of Israel, one who had his back turned on God, one who had been cursed with the disease of leprosy, one who had come to the land of Israel not intending, to, not intending anything except to benefit himself. And the Lord turned his way around and brought him to himself, a child of God. But that's not the only mercy that we see in this account here. We see mercy in what happened to Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, as well. You might be thinking, Pastor, with what had happened to him with that punishment, how can that be mercy? Okay? Yes, God is serious about sin, but the story about Gehazi doesn't stop here. Just a few chapters later, we see Gehazi still serving as the assistant to the prophet Elisha. We see Elisha ministering and seeing Gehazi speaking out in behalf and in support of the Lord and the prophet Elisha. He still has leprosy, but do you know he's still serving? Okay? Gehazi learned a lesson here. He learned that there are consequences for our sinful actions. Say, for example, if we abuse our bodies and there becomes physical calamity or illness, we, that's the result, the direct result of sinful actions. There are consequences for sin. Parents, as you discipline your child and you make rules and those rules are broken, you, have discipline, you take disciplinary action. It's not fun to do. It's not fun for our children to go through, but there are consequences for sin. It doesn't mean that there isn't love. It doesn't mean that there isn't mercy. It doesn't mean that there isn't forgiveness, but there are consequences to sinful actions. Gehazi knew what those consequences were. He experienced them, but he wasn't cast out. He was repentant, he was forgiven, but he lived the rest of the life with the consequences of his sin. A reminder. And this is a reminder to us, too, that the Lord means what he says, even when it comes, when it comes to his law, but also when it comes to that gospel message of forgiveness. What a beautiful thing that is for us to hear on Sunday morning, that our sins are forgiven because of the blood of Christ. Gehazi's sins were forgiven at the foot of the cross as Christ's blood was shed. Elijah's, Naaman's, yours, and mine as well. That's why the Bible tells us so very clearly the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, purifies us from every sin. And it's that blood of Christ, that forgiveness, that gives us a different perspective on our attitude. Okay? It changed Gehazi's attitude. One from not caring about what his sinful actions of thievery would, could have possibly done to a new convert if Naaman had found out that he was being swindled. And thankfully he didn't. But it changed Gehazi's attitude on that. And look how it changed Naaman's. One who had been forgiven just as much is Gehazi. When all of this had happened, and before the thievery had happened, he said to, to Elisha just before he left, he goes, hey, Elisha, just one more thing here. When I go back to Aram, and I serve my master, the king, one of the requirements is, is that I have to go into an idol temple with him. And when I go out in there with him, and he leans on my arm, hangs on my arm, I have to kneel with him. I have to be his physical support with him. This bothers me, Elisha, because it appears like I'm going to be worshiping with him. And Elisha says, go in peace. 
be at peace about this. Elisha was telling, he wasn't telling, he wasn't telling him this. Oh, go off and worship other gods and don't worry about your testimony here. He was saying, be at peace about this. You're not going in there to worship. You're going to be sacrificing publicly to the Lord and giving verbal testimony about that. Be at peace. It's like us, okay? If we go and pay our respects, say, at the religious establishment of some person, whether it's for a funeral or whatever, just going there isn't saying that we approve of what goes on there, right or wrong. But if we join in with worship that violates God's word, then it's a sin. Be at peace. Once again, Naaman's attitude was changed. Once he, he had been brought to the Lord, once he had been forgiven, once he had come to the understanding of God's will, his attitude changed and he wanted to live his life to the glory of the Lord. A different perspective. And that's what Christ does. We who have been brought to faith through baptism, we who have had our faith strengthened, through God's powerful word focused on Christ and the gospel, we who have been washed clean in the blood of Christ and received that body and blood in with and under the bread and the wine when we come to Holy Communion, all of those things give us a new perspective, a new perspective on ourselves, but most importantly, a new perspective on the Lord, the Lord who will stop at nothing to see to it that as few are lost as possible and as many are brought to faith in him. The one who seeks to strengthen our faith, the one who calls to us every single day and says, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What changes our perspective is this. What changes our perspective is Christ. And this is where we find Today we're on the brink of, uh, of the fall, the new school year, educational year. We st take a break from our summer activities and the wall, and we have opportunities for our kids to grow in God's Word in Sunday school. We have opportunities as we have Bible study on Sunday morning. Those things give us the proper perspective on our Savior. If we're far away, we can't see a lot of things. But when we're close, we see him as exactly as he is. Our Lord, our Savior, the one who stops at nothing to give us eternal life. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus.